Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Fate. I am the adult program manager for our adult program here at the Academy of Whole Learning. I'm also going to be joined tonight by Kelsey Touchinger. Uh, Kelsey is our lead life skills teacher, so she's going to be talking a little bit about our instruction and our pedagogy. Hi, Kelsey, and our groupings. Um, just a couple reminders on the call. So this is obviously being recorded. Um, and uh, your mics are all muted. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat. I will answer all questions that I can at the end of this presentation. I will also answer the questions that were already asked in the sign up form. Uh, but when you ask a question, because this is being recorded, just be mindful not to put your student's name or anything like that in there, because obviously we don't wanna be you know, identifying individuals or anything like that. Uh, and we will be sharing this out to um, everybody that signed up. So whether people were here tonight, we'll be sharing it out. If you would like to share this on with anybody else, you're welcome to do that as well. You, you have our permission. So um, we're going to be speaking to a lot of different needs tonight. There are adult ed families on the call. There are K-12 families on the call. There are non-AOWL families on the call. And so some of this is going to be pretty broad strokes. Um, if you feel like we do not address your individual sort of inquiry related to your child and your need, please just reach out to me by email or Kelsey, um, and we'd be happy to kind of just address that or set up a meeting or whatever it is we can do to kind of speak to, to your concern. Um, and then lastly, I just always try to start off these meetings by saying thank you. Um, I love my job. I love what I do. I've done a lot of really weird quixotic things. I taught college classes for many years. I was a stock analyst and a financial advisor. I went to theology school because I thought I was going to be a Catholic priest for a minute. Um, this is the most meaningful thing I've ever done. Starting this adult program, at least in a professional sense, is the most meaningful thing that I've ever done. And it can be hard. It can be tiring. I, I think Kelsey and I, right now, we're kind of in the weeds of, of the school year. But um, I never go to work not knowing why I go to work. And I will forever be grateful for those initial five families who kind of signed up along with us and, and helped get this started because um, to me, this is such a meaningful thing. I love this program and I know Kelsey does too. And I know the participants involved in it do as well. And so um, your buy-in is really what has made this possible. And so I will forever be grateful for that. And, and the fact that, you know, the other thing that I really like about adult programming is it's, it's not mandatory. It's a choice. Um, there's no legal requirement that you attend anything beyond the age of, of 18 or K-12. And so the people who are here, they're here because they want to be here, right? Maybe not every single day. If this was something where they wanted to be here every day, we'd probably have like three students, but they understand the process. They understand the buy-in. They, they like being involved in this. And that's meaningful to me because it gives us motivation to continue to follow through on that um, that desire from them, right? It's an iterative process and it's a meaningful one. So I'm always grateful for that. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> okay, so just real quick, it's a, it's a full agenda, but I think we're gonna work through these pretty quickly. Um, just a little bit of an introduction to the program, our kind of core philosophy, why the program was founded in the first place, some of our student accomplishments this year and our general demographics, our staffing, our pedagogy and instruction, how we group students, our vocational instruction and services, community engagement, some um, changes to the scheduling and some options for next year, a little bit about the new building and our new name, uh, a little bit about our enrollment kind of process and philosophy, scheduling, and then lastly, just to talk about tuition. Okay. So, sorry, my head is in the way of this. Um, we are going to be moving into our third year as a program. And when I started the program, I really, you know, I, I took a long research look at the landscape of, of transitions and, and adult programming. And I, I will never say anything bad about anybody program. I think there's a lot of really good programs out there. And, and I certainly don't want to build our program in a negative way. But I think the one thing that I really wanted to do when we started this program was to be as flexible as possible. I think that is really at the core of what we're trying to do. Again, I think adult ed is an iterative process. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, it's, it's individualized, it builds on itself. I, I've never been comfortable with the idea of like, this is our track, this is the thing that you will do. It's a four-year program, you will be here for this many years, you will take this many classes. And I, I don't, I just, I don't think that's a reflection of the reality of being an adult. 
I'm 39 years old. I've grown a lot in the last five years. Uh, hopefully I never stop growing. <laughs> and I think that, you know, we, we wanted to create a program that reflected that, that captured where each of our individual participants were and tried the best that we possibly could to meet where they're at, right? So we're a flexible culture. We want students to self-actualize their own growth and kind of develop that goal-directed persistence, that self-determination. Again, I think that's more possible when you allow more possibilities for individual expression and growth. We give that specialized attention. Um, at the same time, we want them to express themselves with their like-minded peers. We want them to build a community and a culture uh, and then lastly, I think the one thing that also makes us unique is that, you know, a lot of our students receive those wraparound services with our clinic. So I think about a third of our students also um, uh, are clients within the clinic. And that can be mutually beneficial for a lot of reasons. It's a, it's a place of comfort for them. It's a, it's a place of familiarity. There's obviously just the travel convenience. Um, and when appropriate, there's communication with those staff as well, so that we're both kind of informed of, of, of each other's processes and what's happening. So that culture, that community, and that process, I think is really, really beneficial for, for us and for them. So our, again, at the core of our uh, philosophy is just the idea of being flexible. We believe that no one size fits all. We believe that adulthood is a gradual transition. We strongly encourage our participants when appropriate to work or and or attend college. We really want them to know life outside of AOWL, not even know, but really find their life outside of AOWL. But at the same time, we also want them to feel like this is their home away from home. I think you can do both of those things. Um, and so again, to kind of, I'll get into our scheduling uh, a little bit later to but kind of put our money where our mouth is. We are offering for next year, everything as little as one class per semester or five days a week, 50 weeks a year. And there's a big breadth of programming options that we are lining up for next year, again, to kind of speak to that individual desire and need of all of our participants. I mentioned a little bit the idea of sort of concrete end dates. It is a question I get, it's something that we're working on, but I will say that, you know, we always wanna work with each family to determine what makes sense. Um, I think, if, if it's viewed as a mutual beneficial relationship and we're still growing and there's still that desire, I never wanna put concrete sort of firm dates on, you know, some of the students may feel like they're done in a year, that's okay too. And some may be here till, you know, right now we're at 28. So I suppose that is a concrete date in and of itself, but um, you know, we want this to be an open and accepting and inclusive place where we continue to work with our participants on, on their goals and on what it is they hope to achieve. Okay, so why is this needed? I hope this slide is not my depressing slide. Um, some of the stuff I'm sure is, is pretty common knowledge and we, we centered it around ASD because we have to center it around something. That's about 70% of our populace, but we also recognize that many of our students are, are not on the spectrum. They have other related neurodiversities, but um, these statistics, you know, the post-secondary education is another big piece. There's really not a lot of adult programs that meet the needs of high-functioning ASD students. And, you know, when I was teaching in the high school, that was my, frankly, my core focus. I've obviously shifted quite a bit in, in some of the things that I do, but um, I strongly believe that that high functioning group probably needs a good transitions program or adult program as much as anybody. If you look at some of those numbers, the ones who go to college and 39% who start don't finish. 80% uh, of students who received um, services in high school don't receive them in college. And over half of that is because they, they simply don't self, um, they don't acknowledge or they don't uh, self advocate for, for the services they need. And then lastly, only 10% of graduates with ASD found work in their related field of study. Now to be fair, I also didn't find work in my related field of study, but I think that, you know, a lot of that number is borne out by people who, you know, get a degree in say something like library science, but they never develop the social skills or the executive functioning skills to have those conversations that a librarian would need. Um, to me, that's, it's sad. It's, it's, it's one of the most discouraging aspects of, of working with, with people on the spectrum is that, we're not adequately equipping them, even with extremely high potentials and IQs, to follow through on the potential of what it is that they're able to do. So that remains a very, very key core focus of, of me and what I really want this program to be about, at least for the, for the applicants that that makes sense for. 
the employment numbers are well known. Uh, I would imagine they're probably better recently, although COVID numbers are just kind of all over the place when it comes to employment. But now is certainly a good time to be looking for employment. But 42% of those at the time this was taken, I believe this is about three years ago, uh, with ASD in their early 20s have never been employed, or excuse me, only 42 have ever been employed. By 25, that's still only 63. And six years after leaving secondary school, only 20% are working full time, and more than half of that is for minimum wage or less. And that's not to say that minimum wage is necessarily a bad thing. But it's certainly a, it's a reflection, I think, of the reality of a lot of people not living up to their full potential as they could and, and barriers that are put in place for people that, again, we want this program to function as a way to help service and benefit them so that those barriers are mitigated. Uh, from an independent social living standpoint, more than 50% receive no services in their 20s at all. Again, um, that's a big key focus for us is, you know, when you get into your 20s, when you leave that transition to age periods in the public school or you leave sort of your K-12 programming at AOWL, um, there's a services cliff. And it's, it's not as bad in Minnesota. I think, you know, we'll talk about some of the people we partner with, but, but it is real. And I think if you're not tapped into something or you're not a really active family or, you know, you're not well set up, that can be jarring in terms of just the lack of um, knowing where to go and who to talk to and what to work on. You know, again, we want to kind of fill some, some really obvious gaps. 25% report uh, severe feelings of social isolation and only 20% by their mid-20s have ever lived independently. Next slide. Yeah. So some accomplishments of our own students. Uh, we have a student who is currently working towards a four-year degree, and doing a great job with a 3.0 plus GPA. We have a student who's already a college graduate. I think that's something that's really cool. Um, and they, they're a self-aware enough person to recognize that even with that college degree, there's still some, some social skills, some executive functioning skills that they really need to work on to move on to that next step. And they've been a tremendous asset to the program this year. Uh, we have four additional students who have maintained competitive employment and then three students who have also achieved competitive employment for the first time this year. Our student ages range from 19 to 26, although obviously some of them came in at 18. Eight are AOWL graduates, four came from outside AOWL. We actually just added a new one today. So now I guess five came from outside AOWL. This is our staffing. Um, so obviously I talked a little bit about myself and Kelsey. Combined, we have about 25 years teaching experience and 15 combined years at AOWL. For as young as our organization is, that makes us just absolute fossils. Um, and I like that. I, I love working with Kelsey. We've, we've known each other for quite a while now. And, um, you know, we, we understand the culture of AOWL, right? This program is really kind of steeped in that. And uh, there's not a lot from a teaching perspective and working with different peoples that we haven't seen. So my background's a little quixotic. Kelsey is sort of your core licensed teacher, master's in, in education, licensed in LD, EBD, and ASD. Uh, and then we have uh, a vocational services coordinator within the organization that their primary role is they're the job coach for both our external uh, and internal job coaching needs. And I'll talk a little bit about that more on their slide. But um, another thing that we're going to be really working towards next year is implementation of more hands-on vocationally based programming. So we are in the process of exploring some, some hands-on vocational um, curriculum because I think that's probably the biggest real kind of curriculum need that we have for this year is, is more hands-on based vocational stuff. So that'll be something that they'll be working on implementing. And then they're also our primary creator of external relationships with employers, which I think is something we've made a lot of headway on this year, um, both internally, but then also through all the work that we've been doing with VR. I think that's a big, big benefit for us and, and for the broader population as well. And then lastly, a new hire that we're hoping to make for next year, uh, this community engagement planner, which I'll talk about a little bit more in detail, is um, primarily somebody that we hope will help plan and implement weekly social activities and pretty much all of our community-based instructional activities. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about our pedagogy and instruction. Hello. Sorry, Mike cat decided to jump on my lap right there. Um, so we offer varied levels of instruction. Uh, within that, we have hands-on vocational curriculum, integrated work opportunities. Right now, we are at uh, PRISM, which is a food shelf. We are at Shalom Home, which is an assistant living organization, um, and Rock Elm, which is a restaurant. We offer project-based learning, class discussions, small group instruction, individualized learning paths, 
And then in our core instructional areas, the director, which is Mike, um, offers higher order thinking, mindsets, career exploration, post-secondary education. The lead life skills teacher, which is me, um, I do more of life skills and social skills classes. And then the vocational services coordinator will be doing the vocational programming and the job coach position, taking the students out onto the job sites, um, as well as offering some other sort of um, like social skills within uh, employment. And then our hopeful position for next year, the community engagement planner uh, will plan our social recreation events, community participation and integration. So our, the way that we group, we have the multiple instructors, instructors, which allows us the option to teach multiple classes at the same time and group students based on the best fit. So we base, uh, we group our students based on need and interest, availability, aptitude, and socialization. It also offers for potential for pullouts and community activities as well. But as we grow, these groups will hopefully change. They'll uh, become increasingly refined, but then there is also, we see value to large heterogeneous groups for some classes and activities, having them all together so they can kind of learn from um, the different groups within the whole group. And I'm going to pass it back off to Mike. Thank you, Kelsey. So a couple of these core positions besides myself and Kelsey, um, our vocational services coordinator is also, again, sort of our core implementer of vocational instruction. So we do have those three volunteer opportunities. We're hoping to add about one each year. We think that's a healthy growth. Um, we also do a lot of informational interviews, site visits, and I've set up some uh, college tours as well. Um, that will be starting in, in March, looking into next year. We're also a provider of VRS, so Voc Rehab Services. Um, this is something that's just super cool, and I think really, well, I don't think it is. It's very unique to our organization. We're the only real kind of school that provides services through, through Voc Rehab. Um, and again, I, the thing that I think I like about the best of that is, you know, if you think about private schools, to me, I think inclusive. I don't think out, right? And so one of the things that, you know, not everybody, although with waivers, certainly that opens up a lot more opportunities for us and financial aid and scholarships as well. But, you know, the reality is, is not everybody can attend a private school. And to be able to provide that job coaching, a lot of the self-advocacy, career exploration, social coaching, a lot of those related social, vocational and executive functioning skills, it allows us to just reach a much broader audience. And I think they benefit from that. And I think we benefit from that too. It really kind of iron sharpens iron in that sense. So it's something that we're really excited to do. I think it's a big, big part of the adult program going forward. Um, again, I think just having that staff dedicated solely just to being focused on exploring and finding and maintaining employment, it's just a, obviously it's a key focus for any adult program, but it's a key focus for us as well. And I had mentioned that increased emphasis on curriculum that we really want to build those hands-on skills because that's obviously vitally important for our students as well. <clears throat> and then the other staff member that we're hoping to add, a community engagement planner. Um, this will be a staff member dedicated solely to that community and social exploration. So um, what we're calling fifth or excuse me, plus days um, will be like additional social education community baits on our fifth day and then over all breaks. Um, the idea, you know, again, is we really just want to kind of build that culture and connectivity. I think that's core to our mission. So currently we already have all day Friday social events. We attend fitness center twice weekly and the goal and which we've pretty much followed on this year is, is really to have at least one activity outside of the classroom every day. It was actually a little bit easier last year when it was just me and five students in a bus because pretty much, you know, all of us were together all the time. So we'd be doing a unit and I'd be like, you know what, this unit would be better at the Ridgedale Mall. We just go to the Ridgedale Mall, right? Um, we found that as the program has grown and with the varied schedule and all the flexibility, sometimes that works against you in terms of being able to just kind of on the drop of the dime do something because kids are showing up at different times and they're leaving at different times. So um, the other thing that we're going to do is hopefully work towards building or not building. We can't we can't build transportation, purchasing uh, additional transportation for the program that will give us a little bit more added flexibility as well. But we think with this dedicated staff member, you know, one thing that we're really going to kind of empower them to do is, you know, Kelsey and I are the primary primary teachers, your goal is to look through the agenda, the curriculum for the upcoming weeks and, and help us think of how do we turn this activity on, let's say, you know, this week we're talking about dating. 
how do we make our dating activities community day uh, community based right how do we try to get out of the classroom really as much as we can because i think there's just there's huge benefit to that and i think again having a dedicated staff member to that just like with the vocational services is going to make that i think much much more seamless to implement okay so i have some big well i don't know maybe big is i said big pretty loudly there maybe it's not that big but we have some pretty big changes coming down the pike some of them i can't talk about today but one of them that i'm pretty excited to talk about is that we are strongly considering uh, moving next year to a full year four day a week instructional program calendar so nothing is finalized yet but i have had one-to-one -one conversations with every family in the program i sent out a survey the survey feedback was 100 percent in support so I would say at this point, if we don't do this, I'm going to have some explaining to do to some <laughs> some families. Um, but <clears throat> you know, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more in detail about what exactly that looks like in, in a coming slide. But you know, really, again, we're we're trying to put our money where our mouth is. We found this year, as we're sort of getting into the the doldrums of winter, students are starting to get a little burnt out. Um, if somebody's working 20 to 25 hours a week, and they're also attending our program five days a week, 25 hours a week and they're here from nine to two, and then they work from five to 10, and then they're back at nine. It's a lot, it's a lot, and we recognize that. And so, um, you know, there's five reasons out there, but that's probably the biggest one. We just wanna add more flexible options. And so on that fifth day for our students who work, for our students who attend community college, if they can schedule a work day on that day, that's that's all the better. And that's gonna make them feel, I think, a little bit more reflect, refreshed and relaxed in terms of being here. And this is when they're here and this is when they're at work. You know, I think there's a ton of value to that. Um, so again, less burnouts for students and less burnouts for staff. You know, Kelsey and I have been here for a long time. We wanna stay here for a long time. We want staff members who really love working at the Academy of Whole Learning, but it's a grind, it's a tough job. And so if we can kind of smooth that calendar out, we think that that adds for a lot of different possibilities. It adds for more professional development and collaboration. You know, again, when you get into this kind of heart of the middle of the school year, uh, I do a lot of my best planning over the summer, but things change. And, you know, when you're five days a week or year, well, not year round, but you're five days a week and you're in the middle of the school year, it can be hard to kind of shift on a dime. Having those extra professional development days, I think will be extremely beneficial for us as we think about um, how do we adapt and change to a program in the middle of the year based on what we're seeing and what we're learning with the students. And then lastly, um, well, I guess not lastly, there's two. So it also reflects a real world calendar. I think it prepares our, our participants more for what adulthood is actually like. And it follows waiver. Again, a lot of our students attend on waivers and VR calendars, both of which are fiscal years, right? Most things do not operate on a school year calendar. As an adult program, we really didn't see the virtue of continuing on a school year calendar either. So. I'm talking about it as if it's a done deal. It's not 100% a done deal, but it, it, it's basically a done deal. Uh, and it also allows for some really fun potential getaway options, right? We have some weeks off built in there. It's not a 52 week schedule necessarily, but, you know, so it allows some, a couple weeks in the summer where, you know, so for example, just this year, uh, we're doing our first overnight out of town trip. We're going up to Duluth. We're staying in hotels. Um, uh oh. <laughs> One second. I'm sorry automatic lights. Um, <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Um, so we're doing our first overnight and I would imagine, I don't know, but I would imagine for some of our students that might be the first overnight, not with family outside of the twin cities. I think that's a really cool thing. We'd love to do a week long one. We'd love to do some real true getaways and partner with some of these organizations that do stuff like that. That's more possible with a more varied schedule. You know, I think just kind of keeping um, so that we don't have, again, you know, you come back in the fall and every year it's like you spend the first six weeks reassessing and trying to kind of build back to where you were. The more we looked at it, the more we just kind of thought, what if we didn't have to do that? And so, again, I think that's the direction we're moving. But for this summer, I had multiple questions about summer programming. Yes, we will have summer programming. The adult program will have summer programming. We're also doing essentially what used to be called grad ready, which is like the life skills. Um, basically, it's, it's a modified version of our program for the high school students. And we're calling both Advantage. Um, so we're excited to get back into that. That's actually where Kelsey and I kind of got our start for this program as we were the first ones who taught grad ready. And I think we both loved it so much and saw its possibilities that that just kind of 
it blew up from there. But yeah, we, we are teaching summer programming both for ourselves, but also specifically for one class um, for the high school as well. Okay, uh, new building, new name. I cannot announce the new name. Uh, I've gotten a lot better at keeping secrets over the years. So even if I did know the new name, I'm, I'm pretty good at not, not blurting things out anymore. But I think what I can comfortably announce, at least I hope I can, we're not gonna be the Academy of Whole Learning next year. And uh, I'm really excited about that. From an adult programming standpoint, from an external service provider standpoint, I am gonna be so happy when I don't have to explain to people, yeah, we're the adult programming at the Academy of Whole Learning. We provide services at the Academy of Whole Learning. Academy of Whole Learning to me screams K through 12 school because that's what, it, that's what it was. It was a great name for what it was, but the names that we're exploring are I think much more mature. They're much more flexible. Uh, we also won't be called the adult program next year. We're gonna have a name that sort of better reflects, I think kind of really what we're trying to do and who we are. So that's, that's all very exciting. And I think that information's coming down the pipeline here in relatively short order. In the new building, because we're gonna be in the new building next year as well. I just got a tour again of it yesterday and really exciting. You still have to kind of use your imagination, but, but really exciting to kind of see the possibilities that exist. Um, we will have two dedicated classrooms just for us. We're gonna have two flex classrooms, classes that we share with the K-12 school. So we're gonna have a learning kitchen. So just a place where, you know, we can practice our culinary skills and meal prep and all that stuff. And we're gonna have our own dedicated vocational workspace. So for those kits and for that curriculum, we will have a place to go that really is kind of just for that. And that's exciting, obviously, as well. I mean, these seem like small things, but trust me, from a teacher standpoint, to have a room just to work on projects is just like, oh, it's amazing. So very excited about that. Um, we'll have three dedicated offices, one of which for next year will be a study space. So that is nice for our students who, you know, we have a student who attends um, community college and right now most of his classes are virtual and some of them are synchronous and some of them are asynchronous. So it's nice even just to have the possibility for him to basically have his own space Space that you can kind of go in and shut the door and take a meeting and do what he needs to do. I think that's really exciting. Uh, we have a student lounge rec area that's dedicated just for the adult students. So there's a Nintendo Switch and a TV and a Disney Plus membership. And I spend probably as much time in there as anybody. I love that rec room. It's, it's, it's just, it's cool. It really feels kind of like dorm life. And so I, I, I love the rec room and, and just a lot of shared spaces. I mean, if you haven't kind of tuned yourself in too much with the new building, there's a lot to get excited about the new building. It's going to be super cool. But for the adult program, um, I think long term, it's it's no secret that we probably envision at some point finding our own independent space, whether that means that we're completely out of the new building or not. I mean, who can say? But um, as we grow, and we will, um, we will look for additional spaces outside of, of just the new building. And um, I, I'll speak a little bit to another question I get a lot about, which is housing. Uh, much like the new name, I don't have anything to announce on housing tonight, and I don't want to kind of mislead anybody, but I will say that, you know, um, it's a serious conversation. It's a serious conversation that's being had by serious people. I don't know if I include myself among those serious people, but we recognize it's a need for the community. It's an obvious need. It's up there within its employment and housing. Um, and I always feel negligent in my duties if I don't at least speak to it and make sure that families understand we recognize that need. I think it's an ongoing discussion and a, a process of really kind of doing our extreme due diligence to understand if we are the best to service that need, if, if it makes sense as part of our organizational umbrella. But for families who feel that sense of anxiety, and I know it's out there, we feel it too, we understand it. We want to address it. We wanna be part of that process. We just wanna make sure that we're doing our due diligence. So I guess I have nothing to, to say other than things are being said, but, but we hear you and we understand that. I think I'm safe saying that. Okay, enrollment projections. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the thing that I wanna sort of, um, uh, emphasize with this is, you know, we we went from five to 13 this year. And that seems like a pretty extreme growth. We could have gotten a lot bigger. Um, we're, I want to have small, steady, sustained, manageable growth. I'd like to hire one staff member a year. I'd like to really make sure that every time we do something, we are well prepared for it because we owe it to our current families. We owe it to our current students. And it's a hard part of the job. I never like to say no to anybody. I'm not very good at it. But, you know, we, 
we want to make sure both for us and for them that that fit is there and that it makes sense. And there are programs that, that aren't like that. And God bless them. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. I want to make sure that everybody has a place that they can go as a young adult. Um, but that's not us. We're not a one size fits all. Everybody kind of fits into this program here. We, we say no a lot more than I think people might realize. And I emphasize that because, you know, right now we have our numbers and we expect most of our families to return next year. There's going to be a limited number of openings. We've, we've gotten our applications in now for next year. We're starting to see more. I obviously, we want you to apply. I don't know who you are, but we, we hope you do. We want people to want to be a part of this, obviously. Um, but we also, I speaking candidly as the person who manages the program, I I'd like to know my roster by June 1st. Uh, I, I really do not want to be making enrollment decisions in August next year. And if we are, it's going to be for families that we really feel excited about being a part of this process. I think that, you know, for, for a healthy program, um, we want to expedite this process faster than in years past. And we want to kind of control our growth because I think that's just in the best interest of everybody. Okay. So lots of flexible options. I would mentioned, again, let's assume for the sake of argument here, we move to a four-day schedule. That four-day schedule is probably going to be spread out over about 43 to 44 weeks. So we're looking at probably about 172-ish school days. So a few more actually than we currently have and that are currently in the K-12 school. Um, that leaves obviously breaks, a couple weeks for winter, a couple weeks for summer, et cetera, et cetera. But our full day is basically your, your nine to five or your eight to four or whatever the case may be. I think right now our full day kids are here from like eight to 4.30. Um, so eight and a half hours. So for four days a week, eight, eight and a half hours a day, that's our full day enrollment. And this is really for students who we think it makes sense for our first year students, the ones who really wanna engage with the course offerings or for those who are not yet competitively employed or attending a post-secondary institution. Now, is this a a uh, hard and fast rule? No, not necessarily, right? If you're coming in as a first year, but you're also attending community college, full day enrollment may not make sense for you. Or if you're already working a 15 to 20 hour a week job, you know, that's, that's why we have this flex enrollment. So flex enrollment is very popular this year. Um, I would imagine next year, it's probably sitting at about somewhere between 18 to 20 hours a week on a four day schedule. And this is enrollment that allows for a lighter, more flexible schedule for students who are competitively employed or who are attending post-secondary options. And I had one question in the comments there. Could you explain a little bit more? You know, I mean, it, it really varies. We have some students who are here from 9 to 2.30. We have some who are here from 10 to 2. We have some who are here from 1 to 4.30 or 12 to 5. Or, you know, I mean, it, it really does vary based on the student, but it's about a five-hour day, give or take four and a half to five hours on a four day week. Um, so not quite full time, but still definitely pretty fully engaged in our programming, but it just allows that morning or that afternoon or however kind of the schedule works out to do the other things that we really kind of encourage you to do as you grow within this program. We also offer a la carte offerings. So that could be for students who really have just a demonstrated limited targeted transitions need. I'm thinking probably more people who, um, maybe have already completed a transitions program or, you know, as long as there's a shared understanding that this is a targeted need, right? And it's not just you know, a financial decision or something like that. We really want to continue to meet the needs of people who maybe just want to work on just social skills or just employment skills, or they just want to do the Friday social days, although that's now something else entirely different. But, um, but it, you know, we, we really do break it down in the granular of, you know, if you just want to work on this one thing, here's the courses that we offer this year in that area. We have our community engagement days or our plus days. And again, so that's our social days, our community days, our days that are just completely dedicated to social activities or community enrichment activities or, you know, something like that. Volunteering could also probably fit into that if, if we find the right niche. But, um, and this is another kind of um, something that's applicable both for those full and flex day students, but also community students as well. Uh, we have a family who's just now signing up with us and they're just coming on Fridays. They just want that socialization because they're struggling to find that in a, you know, I guess a normal setting, I don't know how you want to put it, but um, so we think there's added appeal for the community as well with that. Okay. 
So scheduling, uh, the way it works with us is uh, we have our course catalog on the website that was created for about a three year rotation in mind, although we will be adding some more vocational and culinary courses next year because we have the space and the curriculum for it. Most of our classes are designed to meet waiver funding requirements. That's something that we've we've tried to kind of do our research and due diligence on because you know we we want to make sure that everything is copacetic and, and able to be funded through waivers for those that have them. But essentially the students uh, and the families work together. They kind of fill out a preference form, they let us know their availability, and then we create that class schedule based on those variety of factors. Uh, I will say it worked out marvelously this year. I don't know if maybe we got a little bit lucky, but the availability of students matched really, really nicely with both that sort of shared aptitude and socialization and the interest, and we just kind of fit it in there. But I think as we grow as a staff, as we add a variety of different staffing options, we'll still be able to manage that flexibility so that you know we, we can try to fit students based kind of those multi-tiered aspects that Kelsey talked about. Um, to meet the varied needs of, of the people that we work with. Okay, so last slide, a little bit on tuition. So our full day enrollment is based on the number of what the K-12 school is, which is for next year, 33,700. We have decided just for the adult program, we're not gonna add the tech fee anymore. I'm just gonna build that into the tuition. Never been a huge fan of fees. Um, but you know it's it's a it's an increase um the flex day is an increase as well even a little bit more so inflation is hurting and we want to make sure that we can pay our staff wages that are at least competitive enough that they will continue to stay we want a sustainable culture for people who stay here long and unfortunately that comes with with increased tuition prices um but we still think, I mean, if you compare it to the marketplace, these are competitively price, place prices. So 33.7 for a full day, 23.5 for that flex day, again, over the course of a 43 week schedule. A la carte is on a per class basis. And what we're hoping to do with these plus days is really kind of price them very competitively for our current families. So somewhere around $100 a day, it really kind of depends on how many people sign up on each day and things like that. Um, and we may ask families to buy them in bulk. So maybe not like $100 by itself, but 10 days for 1,000 or 20 days for, for 2,000 or something like that. Um, so that, again, if you really wanted to be here and you, you found value in that, and we hope you obviously do when you, when you can, if you're not working, if you're not attending uh, community college, you know, come to Sea Life with us and we'll go to Noodles and Company and we'll, you know, do shopping around the Mall of America. And, you know, I mean, I, I want these to be really competitively priced and attractively priced opportunities because we want people to take advantage of that. We want our students to, to participate because we think there's a lot of value in that. We're going to waive the flex scheduling costs. So last year I had this cockamamie idea that um, for our flex students, for a little bit of an add on price, you could kind of come at eight and you could stay by five and you could, uh, you know, basically hang out in our rec room, which again, I love our rec room. I don't know if that disincentivized it or not. I mean, I, we had a few families who took advantage of it, but my thought on the process was like, well, we, if we don't charge anything, all people will ever be doing is hanging out in our rec room. So maybe that was a little Pollyannish, but um, we want people to come. You know, we, we obviously, you know, maybe not eight to five every single day all the time, but, you know, if you're a flex day enrolled student, or maybe, you know, next year to kind of make that schedule work, we may have an hour or two in between one class and the next class, just like college, right? So this is like our student center. Come hang out in the student center. No questions asked. We're not charging any extra for it. It's built into the cost of tuition. We want students to be here, right? If they're not in class and they're not working and they're not doing anything, I'd much rather they're hanging out with their friends playing Overcooked than at home on their phones. Stay here, hang out, have fun. There's the lights, turn back on. Sorry, that one took a little bit longer. Um, <clears throat> but again, we're not we're not charging extra for that. And then lastly, financial aid is still available for those who qualify. Um, not all of our families qualify or have access to a waiver. So, and sometimes the waiver does not cover the full cost of tuition anyways. So financial aid is still available for anybody who would qualify. Okay, so I'm gonna answer the questions that were sent to me first. Um, so please stick around until kind of no questions are needed anymore. Um, the first one is easy. Do you have summer programming? Yes. 
hopefully answer that question, please um, go through the appropriate channels. But if you need access to, to know what those are, I'm happy to help. help. Uh, hopefully I answered the question about part-time programming, but again, I'm happy to break that down into more individual detail as well. Um, two questions that were a little bit more kind of almost high school focused, but they're good questions. So my daughter will be 16 in October. How will, be, how will she be supported in finding a job at 16 years old? I think the first thing that I would say is make sure she's ready. Make sure that, you know, there's a mutually shared agreement between the both of you that she's ready to be employed at 16. But I'm assuming since you're asking, you believe that she is and she believes that she is. And, and if that's the case, then she probably is. I would say, I don't know if you're an AOW well family or not. If you are, reach out to Mickey, our guidance counselor. If you're not, reach out to your local school's guidance counselor and have them really get you into the process if you're not already of working with VR, vocational rehabilitation services. Um, I think what VR does is fantastic. I think their marketing is non-existent. So a lot of people just simply don't know all of the things that VR does, and they don't always do a great job of explaining it to families. But um, really, they even have what's called pre ats or pre-employment services, where even just that job exploration process, you can get provided with a provider to work you through that whole process. When you're ready to be employed, they can help you find a job. If you need job coaching, they can provide job coaching for that. So it's, it's a great service that now we also are um, contracted to provide that I would say, you know, you don't have to do it through VR. We've had students who just went out and, you know, they went on Indeed and they applied and they got a job. But if there's a need for sort of that support, as is implied in the question, I would start with your guidance counselor and then recommend to kind of get set up with VR if you're not already. <clears throat> Last question on the kind of the pre-ask question, then I'll get to the, um, the ones that were asked during the chat. So um, can you help with preparing slash checklist question mark for those turning 18 in the years after? Yes, but I will say as much as I like checklists for certain tasks, I don't love checklists for adulthood. I don't think there's one checklist and I understand the need for the question. I, I get it, right? There's that tension of like, what should my 18 year old be doing? Um, but I think there's also a logical fallacy that there is a checklist that's obviously going to the meet the needs of everybody on sort of the spectrum or those related neurodiversities. I also worry sometimes that those checklists do not allow for enough grace for the parents and for the student and just making sure that you're taking some breaths and understanding that like 18 is an arbitrary number. It really is. And so I, maybe I'm not answering your question. You can email me. I'm happy to send you checklists. I've got them. But I also just want them to, uh, or I want you to also kind of feel at ease at the idea, because I feel a tension in that question that um, 18 is the start of a journey. And checklists can maybe help you on your journey, but um, don't, don't be too concrete in that thinking. There's a lot of room for growth and opportunity, but I'd be happy if you want to reach out to provide you checklists or that just, just that sort of barometer of really where, where should my child potentially be at 18 years old. Okay, let me look at the chats. Um, all right. Can you please share the current ratio of male to female participants? Yes. Uh, three to one. So for every one female, we have three males. Yes. Yes. Which is pretty much the spectrum, right? It's about average. And that's pretty average for our K-12 school too. We'd love to have more females, um, but you know, that's, that's the breakdown. Give us an example of a schedule of someone who is attending community college for one class for the quarter. Let's say it's 10 a.m. to 12, two days a week. Would they then do part-time with you? They certainly could, yes. And we choose the courses we want for our student adult to learn, or they could work at a company that you assist them finding the other hours in the day. I'm not sure I understand the work at a company that you assist them finding the other hours, like as a job. Um, so it's not quite as simple as you choose the courses. It's a interest like preference question, right? And so um, we take the feedback, we still create the schedule. We are unfortunately not big enough that everybody can just sign up and take whatever courses they want. But certainly we do the absolute best that we can to offer that variety and then fit it around your availability of scheduling. It certainly helps as much as we try to be flexible. It certainly helps to try to build your work schedule around our programming schedule and not the other way around. But we understand that there's limitations to that, especially with community college. You know, if you need to take calculus and calculus is at 11, then you're taking calculus at 11, right? But 
Um, but knowing your schedule or having an idea of when you want it to be, yeah, then we can kind of build that programming around that. Um, if your goal is to work and attend community college, you could still attend our program, but you're, you're stacking a lot on there. So we just, we would want to be cautious about that and making sure that there's an understanding of kind of how everything fits together. So I hope I understood that question correctly. You're welcome to reach out to me if I didn't. Where do we start with the voucher waiver program? Do we automatically qualify or is there income limitations? Nobody automatically qualifies. Um, but no, there are no income limitations. It shouldn't be based on income. It's based basically on degree of disability and perceived level of future independence. Um, it's a tricky thing. I've talked about this a lot. Um, I'm always a little cautious to kind of share too much on something that's being recorded. But basically what they're looking for is, um, I will say that uh, cognitive is going to be a pretty obvious first thing they look at. And that's the easiest thing to qualify based on. If there's a, if there's a cognitive impairment, um, that's, 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 you know, that, that's going to make approval much easier. Um, the first thing you have to do is get approved for MADD. So Medicare through a disability. And then once you're approved for that, the waiver process is actually much, much easier, but getting approved for MADD is based on a, a plethora of criteria, but mostly what they're looking at is, um, if everybody in that person's life disappeared tomorrow, could they live independently? Could that work? Is there the possibility of success? And so one of the things that I always tell parents, and again, I kind of hesitate to put this too much out there, but um, you need to evaluate your kid on their very worst day. You need to evaluate them with steely eyes of, okay, if I disappeared, wh what would happen? Um, I think parents, and I understand, you know, you, you have a tendency, you love your student up, or you're not your student, you love your child up, you, you want to see the best for them. This is the inverse of that. You really want to be, if you're advocating for supports, that case needs to be made, and that case needs to be made on, on the reality, likely, that true full independence is years away and will need sustained supports. Now, not everybody stays on a waiver forever, and they shouldn't. Um, ideally, the CDCS waiver, really, the ideally, our program is not a forever program. We're not a day program. I don't want you here for 40 years. Um, but we also recognize that there's a services and a skills gap that needs to be built up before we can just say, okay, you're 18, good luck. You'll be independent now. That's a good question. But I would say, um, if you don't have a social worker and you haven't explored the process for MADD, that's the place to start and they can help you. But I can also, obviously, I don't, I don't know the individual person in mind here, so I can provide ind individual feedback for that as well. I am staring at a chat that is completely empty and we are at 748. Does anybody have any additional questions? Hope I didn't talk too fast. Oh, I knew that question was coming. <laughs> Do you help with driver's ed licensing? Boy, I'd love to. Um, it's, it's actually a service that we have explored providing through VR. Um, we don't yet. I think if we did, it would purely be for the written. Um, I don't, I mean, that's one area where it's like, I am no more qualified than anybody else to do behind the, the wheel. Um, but I think that for the written, we could fill that gap. You know, I've, I've heard some pretty bad stories from our students who, you know, they go to Minnetonka High School and it's July and there's 300 students there working on the written test, that, that kind of scared straight class, which again, those, those classes are also not built for people on the spectrum. They're built for kids who can't wait to get behind the wheel and drive 80 miles an hour. Um, our kids are the opposite. They, they get behind the wheel and they drive, you know, 10 miles an hour. Um, so I think that we could create a modified curriculum that could really help with those, with that written test. Uh, but we don't currently, but we could. I think, I think that is in our wheelhouse. Um, behind the wheel is not our wheelhouse. And I've, I've heard good things about Courage Kenny. Um, that's a service for people with disabilities to get their driver's license, that behind the wheel training. Um, but I obviously you have to pass your written, or if, if you're over 18, then you don't. <sighs> yes, I have. So the question was, how have you, oh, how have you supported students in college advocate for accommodations? Uh, I've sat next to them as they've written emails. I've gone through their syllabi with each of their professors. I've helped them reach out to the professors at the start of the year. I've helped them reach out to their disabilities office. I've advocated for them when they've had something late and they were like, well, it was my fault. Nah, there's, 
fault is a gray area. We're going to, we're going to advocate for this. Doesn't always work. Sometimes the college can be pretty black and white in the way that they look at it too. But um, for our students who are attending college, I have weekly kind of check-ins. We have a college basically prep course that we work weekly check-ins to make sure that kids are on track. They're doing their work. Um, the kid that I'm working with now, I mean, he's in his second year. He's just He's, he's doing okay without me, but that first semester, yeah, it was a lot of handholding and just kind of saying, you know, this is how you advocate yourself and this is why, and this is what the disability office is supposed to do with you. And I'm going to come to the meeting with you and uh, it's a big piece of it for sure. These are good questions. Thank you. Did anybody watch the Beatles documentary on Disney Plus. I'm about halfway through. It's really good. Yes. Yeah. Therapy, support services. Um, none of our, well, actually, that's not true. One of them does. One of them does do IBI. The majority of our students who utilize the clinic utilize psychotherapy. Um, and I will say our psychotherapists are fantastic. And again, it's, you know, when appropriate, that ability for us to communicate with them can be really, really beneficial for both of us as well. So yes, there is still therapy support services available for adult programming. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that, you know, a lot, so the question was, can you talk about the parts of your program who may not go to community college or learn to drive? Yes, for sure. I mean, that's, that's the majority of our students, at least the community college part, probably the drive part too, frankly. Um, we practice public transportation. We practice a lot of those kind of core life and transition skills. We practice the employment skills. We practice, I mean, I would say probably only about five to 10% of what we do, probably not even 10, is really kind of geared towards that high functioning ASD. I probably emphasize that more in this discussion because I just want to be as inclusive. Most people don't think about adult programming as really being something that applies to high functioning ASD at all because in the public schools, frankly, it's not. Um, but yes, I mean, the majority of our program really isn't specifically geared towards that. It's geared towards that sort of total holistic need of the employment skills, the social skills, the soft skills, the executive functioning skills, time management, prioritization, you know, all of that organization, that kind of stuff. Um, it's getting out into the community, it's socializing, it's volunteering, it's, you know, we've been working on um, mock job interviews for a couple weeks now. I mean, a, a lot of it is, I hope, almost universally applicable, but then just broken down as we kind of break students up into groups. Yeah, most of our students are not, the focus is not really on that piece for them. So if that was, maybe I emphasize that a little too much, but no, I mean, for the majority of our students, they're here to work on those sort of core transition skills. Independent living, cooking, that kind of stuff. Good question. Thank you. I love doing these. I don't know, maybe I just like my own voice, but I really, I love the opportunity to just, I love this program. I love to talk about it. <clears throat> if a student enrolls full day, but then they decide to go to college, get a job, can they move to flex? Maybe. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Um, I think, boy, I think what, what we are moving towards is probably semesters. I think that makes sense. I think they could move in the middle of the year. Um, it's tough from a budget standpoint. I think we're still kind of working that out. When you're so small to have somebody move in the middle of the year. Now, again, we're talking about full data flex, but it's destabilizing to lose even just one family in the middle of the year. It really affects our staffing. But I would say from full data flex, certainly like a mid-year transition, I, I could support that. I could get that behind them. Is summer program for adult listed on the website? <laughs> probably not no it should be i think we just we we just put together the pro shore brochure um and that advantage we didn't actually break it down we're just calling it advantage so depending upon what the sign up for it is that adult program may also include some seniors it may also kind of fit some i'm just going to turn my video off uh it may kind of not necessarily be completely adult exclusive we just kind of have to see what enrollment is but yeah advantages for for both adult programming and for 
um, high school. And obviously it'll be differentiated, but it's for both. Do I offer a shadow day? Sure, yep, we have shadows um, for individuals or families. I don't know if I would have the family come in, but I would certainly have the student come in for sure if you'd like to do a shadow, absolutely. <clears throat> These automatic lights are great until they're not. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, speak now or not forever, hold your peace. Um, but uh, oh, apparently the advantage is not listed on the website. Well, it will be, thanks. <laughs> um, but obviously you can reach out to me at any point. I'm super responsive. It's in the summer catalog, thank you. Where can we contact you for questions? That's a good question. I am assuming that all of you know who the heck I am. So if you, pretty much everybody in the Academy of Whole Learning is firstname.lastname at aowl.org. So my name is Mike and my last name is Fate, F-A-E-T-H. We will also share this webinar, um, but I would say reach me by email and I'd be happy to talk to you. You can also just reach out to the front desk if you want to talk to Paul. He's our admissions person. You can route you through to me for sure. But if you just have general questions, you can also just reach out to me directly as well. So it's in the catalog, the summer program, it's in the catalog, it just hasn't been added to the website yet, so. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I like what I'm seeing, of course, but is there any other program like this out there? Who is your competition for this adult programming? Well, everybody's my competition, but, um, you know, that's a really good question. I think that it, it really depends on what you want. There are some good residential-based programs that are out there. If you want the residential experience, if you want to live in the dorms, if that is really the most important piece to you, obviously we're not competing in that area yet or probably soon. Um, and so that would be like um, MICC or uh, Iowa's REACH program. Now granted, you have to move to Iowa City, um, but there, there's some good residential-based programs. Bethel Build would be another one that kind of fits that mold. Um, there are public school transitions programs. You know, every public school district has a transitions program. I think they do not meet the needs of high functioning people. I just, I don't think they do. I don't think that's their core focus. So that would be a big key differentiator. Um, but I think that, you know, for us, where I really want to hang my hat on is that flexibility. Um, I think that is a major differentiator for us. So again, if you compare us to these residential programs, it's you move here, you give us $50,000 a year. It's a four-year program. You work with the people that we contract with. You do this, you, you know, it's a structured program, but it, there's benefits and negatives to that. Um, so do I think there's a program that's really like ours? I really, truly don't. 
Um, we have kind of designed it to be unique because I didn't just want to create another version of what else was out there, but there are other things out there. And again, I don't ever want to make my hay by being negative. I think everybody who does this, I would hope anyways, does it for the right reasons. We're all looking to fill a need and uh, it's a big one. Okay, well, it is eight o'clock, so I am going to be a teacher and excuse everybody from the call. Um, if you have further questions, you can reach out to me in that email, reach out to Paul if you'd like to set up tour of the program, shadows, obviously, we would encourage that as well. But um, I appreciate everybody for coming out. Again, we will share this webinar out. So if you'd like to share it with anybody that you think may be interested in, you're more than welcome to do that. And uh, with that being said, thank you all. Have a good night.